Good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. It is so good to see you at Lagos on this Lord's Day. Isn't that a beautiful sound to um, hear people uh, fellowshipping together? Here's an assignment. Uh, something Challies wrote last week made me think of this. So, uh, church family, look around. Look around, like behind you. For, so, no, this is serious. So, look around and look for... Um, Maybe somebody that you go, I don't, I don't know them, right? How many of you see, church family, see some people you don't know? Isn't that awesome? That's a blessing. So here's what I want us to do is I want you to already think now, like, okay, at the end of the service, um, I'm going to, you know, sort of pick somebody out that you, you're going to gravitate. Most of the time you're going to pick out somebody that you what? No. And um, so talk to somebody you know later. And um, you can text them later, call them tomorrow. So here's what I want you to do. Pick out somebody you don't know. And then when the service ends, you know, make a beeline. Say, before I do anything else, I'm going to go and um, tell them my name and ask them their name. And I might have to do that again next week or something. But uh, I'm going to tell them I'm glad that we're at, uh, that they're at Lagos. How I many you can do that? Do that. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, absolutely. So, guests, we're so thankful. We... Don't mean to put you on the spot in a negative way. We thank God for you. You can, if you open your bulletin, this is for our church family secondary, but for guests primary, you'll see you can tear off on one side. It's got all the birthdays for September, but on the other side, this would be a good way for you to register. We'd love to follow up with you. We won't like overdo that, but um, this would be a really good way for you to record um, your information so we can follow up and let us know which category you're in. And also church family, this would be a good way if they're prayer requests that you have that you want us to pray for, you could just use any of that. Uh, put your name on there and capture anywhere on the sheet the, um, the prayer request, and we'll be diligent to pray for those needs. i got just a couple of announcements I want to call your attention to. We still have um, need for uh, folks to go on mission coming up in October. Uh, we need to do I don't know how many pastors' retreats we've done in, down in Brownsville ministering to um, alongside Mr. Jack and Ms. Ivadine Henderson, but right now we have zero folks confirmed, and um, we have several slots. We need at least four people to um, go to that pastor's, host that pastor's retreat October 21 through the uh, 23rd. So let April know or contact some of us if you have questions about that. And then the other thing I was going to mention, guys, we're back. We took a couple of months off. Uh, for summer, which was good to do, take a break. We uh, don't want to just run and run and run, but we are back with our men's, we call it men's ministry, Lagos, biblical manhood, whatever that looks like, starts back next Sunday afternoon at five. And so you'll find sign up sheet out in the foyer. We would love men of all ages, men and boys would love to um, have you uh, join us. And what that looks like is from about five to 545, we have um, enjoy a meal together and just hang out. We come real casual like t-shirts, ball caps, and shorts and that sort of thing or whatever works for you. And uh, then we um, look into God's Word and we discuss God's Word together. We do all that in uh, the Awana building. So I uh, would love for you to be part of that. We are today going to look at the second con commandment. As you know, we're working through Deuteronomy. If you've been with us, you know that. And um, I'll just sort of go there on the sermon just a little bit to whet our appetite. So the first commandment is making sure that we're, ah, this sounds, making sure we're worshiping the right God, right? Make sure we're worshiping the right God. That's really, really important. Second commandment is making sure we're worshiping the right God in the right way. And what we're about to do right now is, um, I want you, it, listen, it's not about us. It's about him, and it involves us, and uh, we are to worship him in spirit and truth. More to be said about that, but um, my hope, our hope is that we will pray the word, sing the word, read the word, preach the word, honor God with our tithes and offerings and proclaim Christ coming uh, and proclaim him as Savior and Lord until he comes again. So, Mr. Joe, would you come and pray for us, brother, as we worship? Dear Lord, what a joy to come in your house this morning to uh, meet with the family of God and to uh, share and uh, hear. And dear Lord, I just pray even now that uh, as we enter into a time of praise and worship and even communion, dear Lord, that you would uh, move in our hearts and our lives and just to reveal those areas of our hearts maybe that is uh, 
not Christ-like, and we could say, search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any evil way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And I just pray even now that our hearts and our minds are attuned to you, we'll draw towards you, and we'll look towards you, and look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are here to worship the Lord together. Let's stand together this morning as we sing. Two, three, four.
Acts 17, uh, 16 through 31, where Paul preaches to heathen, pagan, idolatrous philosophers in uh, the great Greek city of Athens. So very interesting. Now Paul was waiting for them, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? For he brings some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness 
by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Wow. Let's pray. Mm. Lord, we thank you. And you we live and move and have our being. You give to all mankind, mankind life and breath. Let us know that our very next breath literally is a gift from you. Lord, remind us that you're God and there is no other. You are the creator of heaven and earth, therefore the owner and ruler of all. Lord, we honor you today. We praise you today. We thank you that you have appointed a man and uh, approved him universally by raising him from the dead. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, uh, today as we look into the law, uh, we're just reminded that the Lord Jesus uh, took the curse of the law for us and has given us that spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you work in us now, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Father, we, uh, we love you today. Uh, give us ears that hear, eyes that see, and hearts that understand this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing together. You made the starry host. You traced the mountain peaks. You paint the evening skies with wonders. The earth that is your throne from desert to the sea. All nature testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Sing His greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west. Let in your very likeness to know your wondrous works to tell your mighty deeds to join the everlasting chorus praise the Lord praise the Lord sing his greatness all creation
copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to um, Deuteronomy. If you're a guest with us, by the way, and you don't have a copy of God's Word, you'll find one there uh, under one of those seats in front of you. But Deuteronomy chapter 5, we have for several weeks been working through this great um, book, Moses' uh, last, his preaching for the last month of his life, sort of his last sermons, if you will. We're just now getting underway in the second sermon. It's a familiar passage that um, we also would read over in Exodus, um, the, what is the Ten Words or Ten Commandments. And so I don't know at what, what pace we're going to move um, in coming weeks, but we're going to look at the second commandment only today, the second commandment, the danger of worshiping God in the wrong way. As mentioned earlier, the first commandment, the exhortation, the command that we would have no other gods before God, before his face, that we would worship only him. And I want you to think about this. Sometimes we, we would uh, be misguided in our thinking like, okay, for those people who worship, well, everyone is a worshiper, right? Everyone worships. And so uh, it is essential that we worship God there is no other. Studied that in the previous chapter, and we worship him in the right way. And you might say, well, I don't worship any one or anything other than God, and worship has to do. So think about this. Where is it that our, um, our delight goes, our devotion, our excitement, our focus, our fulfillment our significance, our identity. Ooh, this is the key, our passion. What is it that, um, you, you know, I've, I even think about how we get excited about things. And that's got a proper place way on down the list. How many of you, you have found to um, get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go catch a flight for work is really, really excited. You wake up just like jumping up and down, running out the door. But what if you're going to get up at, three o'clock and go duck hunting that alarm just hits me different y'all any you're right or to like uh mm, to like you know I said well duck hunting is worship well it can be right um but it shouldn't be but our delight and our passion and by the way we're going to um end the sermon focusing on Christ and we know we talked about those purposes of the law purposes of the law. So the law, first of all, is a mirror, that mirror. Remember we talked about that mirror? We look in the mirror and we go, there is no way. That's a great, great place to be because then we look to Jesus and uh, Jesus has fulfilled the law. But as you'll see in our passage, this is also another purpose of the law is it's a means whereby we live lives of service and devotion and worship and uh, in, in, a way that, in ways that are pleasing to God. So, second commandment, the danger of worshiping God in the wrong way. I want to get a running start. I'm going to start in Deuteronomy 5, verse 6. We certainly looked at that last week, but that grounds the commandments in the proper context in the gospel, I believe, and we'll study down to verse 10. If you're able, would you stand while I read um, our passage this morning? Deuteronomy 5, verse 6, the word of the Lord. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word. It is our prayer that we would see, behold, 
uh, embrace, live out wonderful, wonderful things from your law. We thank you that in your law we do see ourselves rightly, God, and we see um, the impossibility of us having any hope apart from Christ. And we pray that uh, in Christ today, Lord, we will live out these wonderful promises. God, we are worshipers, and um, we pray you will reorder our desires, our our worship, God, that we pray that we would worship you alone and we would worship you in the manner that you have prescribed, God, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As mentioned, we're in Moses' second sermon. We're um, taking a look at the 10 words. We're dealing with the first four. Um, well, the first four, let me say, deal with um, the first table, as it's sometimes referred to, of the commandments, but dealing with our um, vertical relationship to God. So our vertical relationship to God. And we're going to get into those words, the commands that deal with our horizontal relationship. Love God, love others, right? But this first table and these first four deal with our vertical relationship to God. And I want you to pay attention because it um, is essential we get this right. I believe in our flesh the perpetual thought that the Bible clearly corrects and condemns and contradicts. But in our fleshly thinking, we are prone to believe that if we do good things and right things, that will somehow move us to God. And if we do enough good and right things, and we never do, we think, um, well, we, we never do, but we think that somehow those are going to get us closer to God, and the gospel blows all of that up. And so this first point is so, so key, and it's not a point in the sermon, but it's verse 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And I want you to see this. Grace precedes obedience. Salvation precedes obedience. Since God in Christ has saved us, we are to order our lives the way the owner has written the manual for us to live, right? It makes a whole lot more sense. And whereby we glorify God, we live lives that are blessing to us and make a great witness for Christ. But verse 6 is key. I am the Lord your God who brought you out. So God had saved them. He had redeemed them. And now he's instructing them how they are to live. So verse 7, last week, the first word was the object of our worship. So think about that. The object of our worship. It is a dangerous thing to worship the wrong God. Turn back to Deuteronomy 4. Verse 35, here's why it's a dangerous thing to worship the wrong God because all other gods, look at verse 35, Deuteronomy 4, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, he is God, there is no other besides him. Drop down to verse 39, know therefore today, Deuteronomy 4, 39, know therefore today and take it to your heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and on the earth below there is no other since he is God and there is no other. It's really, really important that we worship him. So that first word, we studied that last week, but the object of our worship, we are to only worship God. I've been, well, this is a good thing, right? I've been working with this all week. We are only to worship God. And listen to this, we are to only worship God in the manner that he has instructed, prescribed, directed. So we're to only worship God and we're to only worship God in the way the manner that he has prescribed. The second commandment, that's what it is about, the manner of our worship. So drop down to Deuteronomy 5, verse 8, and we'll get to it. You shall not, start at verse 8, look at verse 9. You shall not. So the warning is again stated in the negative. It's stated in the negative, right? Here's what we're not supposed to do. So verse 8, you shall not make for yourself an idol. So that brings me to the uh, first point for our sermon. Number one, we must be careful to worship God in the way he has prescribed. It's a, the principle is pretty straightforward, wouldn't you say? That's a pretty straight, so stands to reason, God, he is God, there is no other. And he, not we, should determine the way we worship, right? He, 
not we, should determine the way we worship him. So, verse 8, you shall not make for yourself an idol. So, an idol, an image, or any likeness. Look, and so, God is the creator. He, is, he rules over all. He's sovereign over all. And so, to worship wrongly is to make an image of God or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. So, this is a, it's a clear principle. It's a warning against idolatry. And so, I want you to think about this. We're not free to do as we please and call it worship. We don't have that freedom. You shall not make for yourself an idol. So it's an attempt, this idol making or making a likeness is an attempt to represent God in some physical way. Right? It's to make something, carve something, think of something, to, to try to take God who is over all of his creation and bring him down and represent him some, in some physical way. You shall not make for yourself an idol. I like what this commentator said, uh, Peter Craigie, the near eastern neighbors of Israel. So they lived in the world. All their neighbors used a variety of images to represent their deities, but Israel alone refused to employ imagery. I recall when I was in Egypt, by the way, I think of the, all the relics, you know, if, if they talk about if all the apostles had that many bones of all the people that claim they do, you go in these churches and they'd be like, hey, come over here, we want to show you this relic. And, you know, Peter's finger bone is over here, and they, but they got all these relics. And, and the second word, the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. And by the way, we get... And a vivid illustration of this, a powerful illustration of God slaughtering 3,000 in Exodus. So listen to this from Exodus. Exodus 32. Here's what breaking the second commandment. We're going to talk in just a minute what that looks like in our day. But here's what it looked like in Moses' day. Exodus 32 verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, look at this, come, make us a God. Oh, that should have been a red flag right there, right? Whoa. Second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness. So anyway, the people said, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron, foolishly, I might add, sinfully, Aaron said to them, tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. Now, so listen to this. They've made Yahweh into a bull. Right? It sounds like that's a, right? How do you think that's going to go? And by the way, they're about to have an orgy. What do bulls do? I like what Alistair made. Bulls are, and God's going to slay 3,000 people. So, Verse 4, he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, listen to this. This is your God, O Israel, who brought you from the land of Egypt. A bull? Now, you think God's going to respond being saying, you know what, God, Yahweh, you're a bull. Verse 5, now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. They had a feast, all right, but it wasn't to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That'd be an understatement. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. Listen, no images. Faith doesn't come by seeing. Faith comes by what? Hearing. We get an image, we see God, and we can worship him rightly. No, that's paganism. That falls far from God. Verse 8, they've quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They've made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone 
that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. So you know what God had them do? He had them get their sword and just go through the crowd, slaying as they came and went until 3,000 men were slaughtered. That was, that's, a, that's a vivid illustration of the danger of breaking the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. So we must be careful to worship God in the way he has prescribed. So I think, so we're going to press in more on the second point. But what does this look like? What is an idol? Well, I don't think most of us are doing much carving, but anything, listen, we place above or alongside God. Anything we would place above or alongside God, hobbies, relationship, possessions, anything that competes for our, devo- uh, our devotion, I should say, or loyalty, what we treasure, where we find pleasure, where we find fulfillment, right? That's what they were looking for, something they could bring God down to. So this, this first reality, we must be careful to worship God in the way he is prescribed. So God is spirit, he is spirit, and we worship him in spirit and in truth. So turn back to Deuteronomy 4. I feel like we're in Bible drill, but that's good. Deuteronomy 4, verse 10. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and thick gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. Look at this. You heard the sound of his words, but you saw no form, only a voice. And it's almost like they in their day and we in our day, it's like, it's almost like we say, God, we know we have the Bible, but if you can give us something a little better... That, that gets you to the golden calf, right? So God's given us his word. So God is spirit. God saves by his word. Faith comes by, not by seeing, but by hearing. God is separate from his creation. So to craft something in his likeness, however we do that, is to diminish him. Here's some statements that we might catch ourselves in worship straying into idolatry. Have we said Something like this. I like to think of God as. Or have we said things like this? I hear this a lot. Have you ever heard people say, I couldn't worship a God who? You ever heard that? You need to be like, be real careful what you're about to say because I'm going to ask you. I'm going to challenge that from Scripture. I couldn't worship. Now, by the way, that tells me I couldn't worship a God who. That means who's the architect of God in that scenario? You're the designer of God. I can't worship a God who. So uh, have you ever heard of people say, my mental picture of God is, right? We just need to be careful that those are biblical. Turn to, the sermon got longer, but since I sent the handout, turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, here's, I like Paul weighs in on this. Look at Colossians 3, verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality. What would you say is the mark of our culture today? Certainly in the world and a lot of times in the church. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and greed, which, listen to this, amounts to idolatry. All those things are worship, according to Scripture. So immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, they're worshiping clearly, oftentimes the wrong God, and if we're trying to worship God, boy, that's not the manner, is it? It's not a, you know, it, so we might look at this and think, man, I'm, I'm so glad I didn't live back in Moses' day. Those people were really messed up. <laughs> and I'm glad we're so much brighter, more holy, more pious, right? And no, 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 we're to look at this and say, knowing they were so prone to idolatry, boy, we who God has given so much, we're going to be really, really, really as prone, if not more prone, toward falling 
um, and breaking the second word, the second commandment. Number one, we must be careful to worship God in the way he has prescribed. It's really the saying the same thing in number two. Number two is fleshing it out. The manner of worship is so serious, our manner of worship, the manner of our worship is so serious because it is so closely connected to God's nature. I know that doesn't just fall off your tongue, but I'm trying to be faithful to the text. The manner of our worship, how we worship, is so serious because it's so closely connected to God's nature. Look at verse 9. I'm back in Deuteronomy 5 now. So we get the second shall not. Verse 8 started. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness. Verse 9, you shall not worship them. Now, by the way, look at this. This gets at what idolatry, that working of that does. If we're not careful, we're going to worship in the wrong manner, and you shall not worship them. And you know where worship really takes you? You know where uh, devotion and loyalty really takes you? To serving that God. Since we're all worshipers, we'll, listen to this, we'll end up worshiping and serving whatever it is that we worship. You shall not worship them or serve them. And here's why. I love this. God gives us the warning. Verse 8 and first part of verse 9, you shall not make an idol. Verse 9, you shall not worship. God says, let me tell you why. Because I'm pretty serious about the manner that my blood-bought people worship me. That makes sense, doesn't it? Again, think, you know, healthy, good marriage scenario. You wouldn't say it's the mean husband to say, let me tell you something, honey. I am absolutely, wholeheartedly wholeheartedly devoted to you. And I expect that you will be so to me. You wouldn't be like, man, that guy's being harsh. Right? So God said, look at, look at this. This is so, it's so clear why the second commandment, the basis, get our worship right. Verse 9, you shall not worship them or serve them for, here, the reason God says, for I, Yahweh, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So that word, you can underline it there. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God's jealousy is an adjective for God. It occurs, listen to this, only six times in all the Old Testament. Six times. And it speaks of an active quality. Listen to this. A passionate loyalty. Are you being devoted and loyal to me, God says, to me and to you? Are you, being, are you focused on me? Are you taking something, I've, David, I've given you and elevating it to a place that I have not, that I do not allow that's wrong? And so this is, it makes sense. How we worship God is so serious because it's connected to his nature, to his character, to who he is. So you're not to worship them or serve them because He's God, there is no other, and he is jealous. He, we're, not to be, we're not to be sleeping around with our worship. We're not to be giving our worship to other things, right? Well, God, you've, you haven't, you don't allow this, but I just sort of do this on the side. I just worship this way because I like it. That, we know that doesn't fly. You shall not worship them, verse 9, or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And listen to this. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, thousands of generations to those who love me and keep my commandment. Now, by the way, it's a threat. It's a warning, isn't it? God said you worship wrongly, there's consequences, and you worship rightly, there's consequences. Very different consequences. So the threat is visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. That's strong language. By the way, God says, God doesn't say those who, you know, don't think as highly of me. No, he just draws that line really, really what? We either love him or we hate him. Man, that's strong language, isn't it? Scripture doesn't, you know, like, oh, I don't know that people would just say it like that in our day. Well, it's said in the way God wants it said. And however he said, it's how we want to say it. And that helps me see, mine and your worship and worshiping in an improper manner is not like something's, mm, it's sort of minor, tertiary. No, no, worship is really, really serious. God takes it serious and we should 
as well. Now, by the way, how many of you, when I read verses 9 and 10, and you say, visiting the iniquity on the fathers, on the children, and this, is that a generational curse? How many of you think, like, what does that mean? That's a, that's a good question. What does that mean? So let's look at the text here. And by the way, the prophet's going to help us. Ezekiel gives us a lot of commentary here that we're about to look at. Verse 9, you shall not worship them or serve them. These man-made likenesses, idols. Why? Because Yahweh, he's God. There is no other and he's a jealous God. And listen, this sin, our, I, I believe, I'm confident what that believes is our sinful influence if, if I charge into sin and worship wrongly, guess what kind of influence I give to the children, my children who come after me? And if they're not careful, so that sin begets more sin and they observe that sin in me and then they're likely to follow in that sin. And so if this generation hates God, guess what the next generation does? Likely. Daddy modeled it. Mama modeled it. It's easy to continue down that path and they continue on so listen to what ezekiel i know i've got too long not it's not too long but two two long <laughs> illustrations from scripture this um this morning and uh we looked at that in exodus but here here's what i want you to hear children are not punished for their parents sins by that the meaning is that if parents influence their children away from god those children, like their parents, end up hating God. Let's look at this from Ezekiel. Ezekiel goes all over this, and I just picked 20 verses. I cut it in half. So Ezekiel 18, here's a clarification of this. Verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, yes, God's swearing, right? You picture God, you know, he's in the courtroom. As I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Listen to verse 4. This would be good. I know we don't have a billboard, but we could put this on there and it'd be good if we had one, right? Behold, all souls are mine. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Behold, all souls are mine. So who owns the souls? There's one soul owner. Man, I want to know him, don't you? I want to be, since he owns all the souls, I want to be on good ground with Yahweh. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. Now listen to this. Here's the principle. The soul who sins will die. It's more clear speak, isn't it? Verse 5, now we get some, Let's work this out. But if a man is righteous and practices justice and righteousness and does not eat at the mountain shrines or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel or defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman during her menstrual period, if a man does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, does not commit robbery but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing... If he does not lend money on interest or take increase, if he keeps his hand from iniquity and executes true justice between man and man, if he walks in my statutes and my ordinances so as to deal faithfully, he is righteous and will surely live, declares the Lord God. But look at verse 10. This man might have a son. Then he may have a violent son. So it sounds like a son who's doesn't know God, doesn't love God, doesn't obey God. Then he may have a violent son who sheds blood and who does any of these things to a brother, though he himself did not do any of these things. So the father didn't, but what? The son did. That is, he even eats at the mountain's shrines, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore pledge, but lifts up his eyes to the idols and commits abomination. He lends money on interest and takes increase. Will he live? He will not live. He has committed all these abominations. He will surely be put to death. His blood will be on his own head. Now behold, he has a son who has observed all his father's sins, which he committed and observing does not do likewise. So you look, okay, you're sitting there going, man, my, maybe you're saying, 
my daddy was a pagan. I mean, he, maybe he did anything. He did, I maybe did everything but live in a way that's pleasing to God. Listen to this, verse 14. Now, behold, he has a son who has observed all his father's sins which he committed, and observing does not do likewise. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel or defile his neighbor's wife or oppress anyone or retain a pledge or commit robbery. But he gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing. He keeps his hand from the poor, does not take interest or increase, but executes my ordinances and walks in my statutes. He will not die for his father's iniquity. He will surely live. So listen to this. You've heard it said, through, it's, it's, it's a good saying, you know, God has no grandchildren. We come to God one by one. And so um, I hadn't, I hadn't liked stuff. Next, the 10th will be two months since my daddy died. Um, my daddy's in heaven. My daddy's in heaven. His daddy, near as we can tell, my granddaddy Brooks is not in heaven. He was a uh, mean, alcoholic, harsh, ungodly man. Um, so near as I can tell, my granddaddy Brooks not in heaven. My daddy's in heaven because of Jesus. But listen to this. I'm not going to heaven because my daddy's in heaven. I'm going to heaven because I have been saved by God's grace and I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. How about that? In the Bible, there's just continuity in the Bible. Amazing book. So let's go back to the end of verse 17 of Deuteronomy. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18. We'll come back and finish up Deuteronomy in a minute. End of verse 17. If he walks in my statutes, he will not die for his father's iniquity. He will surely live. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was not good among his people, behold, he will die for his iniquity. God deals with us one by one. You... I'll go first there. I'll stand before God and give account for my own sin. You will stand before God and give account for your own sin. Verse 19, yet you say, why should the son not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity when the son has practiced justice and righteousness and has observed all my statutes and done them, he shall surely live. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. I, now, let's go back to Deuteronomy 5. I know we chased a bit of a rabbit, but I think that question is prompted in that text. We were dealing with the second point of that. The manner of worship is so serious because it is so closely connected to God's nature. And by the way, look at the promise in that, and that gets us to the gospel. Look at verse 10. But showing loving kindness to thousands, thousands of generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. That's good news. And on the other hand, it's bad news because I don't love God rightly and keep his commandments. Do you? But listen to this. We have a progressive revelation and scripture tells us that there came from God one who is God who descended from heaven, who came down. And guess what he did perfectly? He loved God perfectly and he kept God's commandments perfectly. And if you are in him, Jesus Christ, you get this full, free atonement, salvation, eternal life. That's shouting ground, isn't it? I know it's Baptist. You know, well, I don't know if I'm that excited about it. We are. Get us that way, Lord. Listen to what Jesus said, Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So we look in that mirror and we see that law and we say, there's no way. And then we say, thank you, Jesus. All right, let's apply the word, do the word, live out the gospel. I mean, the, the last one's going to be proclaiming Jesus' death until he comes, so... First, look to Christ. Only he can give us salvation so that we can love and obey God. 
By the way, that's back. You say, well, you're, you're jumping to the New Testament. No, jump back to Deuteronomy 5, verse 6. Salvation, God's redemption, precedes our obedience. I am the Lord your God who brought you, saved you, redeemed you out of the land of Egypt. So look to Christ. Only he can give us salvation so that we can love and obey God. Second, order our church services by the regulative principle. Worship God as he has directed in his word. The regulative principle. So how has God directed in his word? Well, he's, here's some things I know. And by the way, there's some liberty in there, but um, not as much as a lot of people think. So we worship on the Lord's day, right? That's in God's word. We worship, um, un, listen, to the, until I come give attention to the public reading of scripture. You think we're to read scripture and worship? Okay, um, Preaching scripture, in season, out of season, what? Preach the word. Colossians, hymns, songs, spiritual songs, right? Um, singing biblical songs, prayer, giving of tithes and offerings. So, um, now, it, I don't have jurisdiction there. Sometimes I feel like uh, a little bit like Barney Fife, you know. Um, Barney, like, he would, he would, Scott Shields, an expert, he can tell you anything you want to know about Barney. He's all things Andy and um, Mayberry. He's the expert. But um, I'm like Barney in this. Sometimes I, I, I would, um, I'm going to stick my nose just a little bit in other people. Barney would get, right, he would overstep his authority. But I'm just going to tell you, some of the things I see churches doing in our day, they're not paying attention to the regulative principle. Right? You don't have to say amen to that. I'm right. <laughs> and, 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 and let me tell you where where we get off track, we'll go like, you know, we want people to come to Lagos. We do. And this is where you get off track. I love what Al Jackson told me, tells others, it's your job to fill the pulpit, not the pews. I know we don't have pews, but you get it. So where you get off track is saying, and, and we've done this in epidemic proportion in the Bible Belt in America. It's like, what kind of cool things do we need to do to get all these blue seats filled? Right? Here's what I'm going to say. We order the worship service not for lost people. If you're here today and you're lost, we are glad that you're here. This is not about you. How about that? We don't have great coffee. I mean, it's acceptable, I'm guessing. We don't have cool features. All, but here's what. We're here to worship God. And we're striving, we're not doing that perfectly, we're striving to worship him in the way he has prescribed. And, and you know what he's prescribed? We gather on the Lord's day, scripture's prominent, it's all over. Preaching scripture, reading scripture, singing scripture, praying prayers, giving of tithes and offerings. And, so, and, and, and we don't, I don't want to get in trouble, we don't really care if lost people don't like that. Because they don't even get a vote. And their best hope is to see God's people worshiping him rightly and hear this great gospel whereby this gospel God has saved us by grace and God in that environment is most likely to save them. So why would we, it would be like you showing up at the doctor and you have been a platinum couch potato and telling the doctor how he or she needs to practice medicine. You know what a nice doctor is going to say is, you be quiet. You're about to pay me $150 for my time, and the doctor will tell you that, that right, God has, <clears throat> I get frustrated. You can probably tell. Worship wars, all this. We, I remember early on, um, a couple, been at Lagos for a couple years, and a guy told me at lunch one day, he's like, man, we're going to so-and-so church. We just like their band better. I'm like, really? Their band. And your likes. Hey, by the way, I'm thankful for our band. But don't let the quality or lack thereof of my preaching God's word, because I want to preach that, or the quality or lack thereof of our man, you and I should be thinking when we walk in here, how has God said we're to worship him? And we're to be striving to do that in ways that please him. And the audience we want to please is him, not them. Right? You get that? And by the way, we would say this 13 years in, we know we hadn't done it perfectly, but man, isn't God doing a good work in this church? 
And what you're saying in that, I, I, you know, you see like, hey, guys, we want men in church. Are we going to give away a Benelli? Like, man, we want men in church. God, show us how to love men. I'm going to tell you, if the Bible won't get them, the Benelli won't keep them. Right? It's going to take, it's going to take the four-wheeler. And, and by the way, you say, he's making this stuff up. No, just go look around the church. Hey, man, you know, we're trying to pack it out for Resurrection Sunday. We're going to give away a four-wheeler. We're going to raffle off a bass boat. And all. Give me a break. How about this? We're going to preach the word, read the word, pray the word, sing the word, and be together and give tithes and all. Right? Amen. 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 God, help us to do that. Order our church services by the regulative principle. I'm going to pray, and um, we're going we're gonna to transition to the... Um, Supper, which is a, God has prescribed a way that we proclaim Jesus' death. That picture, he gives us a picture there, hasn't he? Proclaim of that um, bread and juice, the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. And, uh, Lord, we are mindful that um, we're prone to think everything's about us. And um, we repent of that, Lord. We, we want to worship you rightly. God, we... We thank you for this great gospel, Lord. You've not given us a movie or a clip or a skit or an a interpretive dance or some kind of foolishness like that, Lord. You've given us a clear word, and uh, we are so grateful for that. And, uh, Lord, we repent of where we have um, been careless in our worship, where we've been self-centered in our worship of you, God, it is about you. It's not about us. And so we pray you will correct us and um, pray we would even learn from the idolatry of, um, of Israel, Lord, that we are quickly prone to wonder. Guard us, Lord. Uh, we think of the commentary out of Ezekiel, Lord, that you own all the souls, the soul that sins, God, will die. And we know that is um, descriptive of us. That's our old address. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that has washed away our sin. Uh, God, we pray that um, as we enter into the ordinance, Lord, that we will be able to rejoice and celebrate who Jesus is and what he has done. Lord, we, we pray if there are unbelievers in our midst, Lord, we thank you for them. We pray that your spirit, God, would grab a hold of, of them. God, you would convict them of their sin and show them the beauty and glory and sufficiency of Christ. And today would be the day of salvation. Lord, I pray we'd be a church that's not chasing the world's ways, um, the world's fads, but uh, that we um, walk in a manner worthy of you, God. I pray if there are areas where we're doing things that we don't need to be doing, would you reveal that and give us grace to stop? And if there are things that we're not doing, God, that we need to be in our worship, Lord, would you uh, make that clear and uh, continue to uh, correct us and prune us, um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll ask our deacons um, who are going to be assisting in the supper if you would come on forward at this point in time we practice as it relates to communion we practice open communion i had an email on this this week that uh from a member which was good a good email said you know help me understand our communion so we practice uh our the table as this uh, we we fence the table what we mean by this um is uh jonathan uh, the sermon what time is it that's late and it? it's getting longer i'll about to be fast so jonathan edwards went to a um, pastor church in Northampton, Massachusetts. His granddaddy had pastored, right? And um, he, his granddaddy had a very unbiblical practice of he would let unbelievers participate in communion, right? Lost people. And um, Jonathan, God bless him, he stopped that practice, and his first cousin led an um, uh, effort to get him fired, but he was still right. And sometimes doing the right thing will get you fired. So if you're not a Christian, we uh, don't want you to participate. Um, if you're a Christian and you're a good member, uh, you're a good member. You're a member in good standing at Lagos Baptist Church. You're invited to participate.
Also, if you're a Christian and you're a member in good standing of a church with similar faith and practice, in other words, you're a born-again believer, you've been obedient and followed the Lord in believer's baptism, we would invite you to participate as well. So we practice open communion from uh, that um, perspective. And um, we take seriously, by the way, this is one of those points of uh, church discipline, and I can report to you at this time that all the members that are present are members in good standing because um, if we had members who were under the discipline of the church, we would also uh, refuse discipline at that point. I'm going to pause again and um, slow down. Stephen, would you thank Jesus for his body and blood before we serve? Will you do that? Lord, what we reflect on in these next few moments, God, cost Jesus his life. He took on our sin to redeem a people so that we might be forgiven, so that we might have freedom from the, the guilt, the shame, the enslavement of our sin. God, we are grateful that Jesus bore our sins on the cross in his body for us. Father, we reflect and we ask that you uh, would work even in these next few moments, God, revealing sin in our hearts, our lives, that we may repent, turn away. And Father, that you would be glorified even in this time of worship. And soon we pray.